Good afternoon, everybody. So, since I just finished talking about seed and intentions, chemical carryover, so on and so forth, I thought maybe I'd have a coffee with you guys and we could kind of dig into the Saskatchewan Crop Protection Guide. What is the Saskatchewan Crop Protection Guide? It's a really good question. It's basically our manual for chemicals and, uh, you know, tells us all about them, what they need, uh, how much rain they need to break down, what crops we can use them on. Basically, that's it's your manual. It's your chemical manual. Now, each province has their own. Um, for the majority, the chemicals are all overlapping with the exception of a few. But at the end of the day, um, this is your homework. This is what you need to learn. This is what you need to memorize. If you're wondering about what happened here, well, there was a big deckle there. I just kind of tore that off. But anyways, I thought maybe I could dig in here uh, while I drink my coffee and uh, let's see if we can't learn something. In saying that, I did do a video like this, um, I think, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before now, but uh, I had done a video like this before, but it's been a little while, so I thought I would just kind of update you guys here a little bit, okay? So this is basically all things chemical in this book. Um, as you can tell, it gets thicker every year because I keep adding to it. And you see all these little uh, gray uh, lines right here. Well, this kind of, this is just easy access. So I do believe this first one's just introduction. Pretty sure, just introduction. Uh, yes, it is. And then the wider one here is just like your herbicides. Yeah, weed control. Then this one I do believe should be fungicide. Yeah. And then this one is either seed treat or insecticide. It is seed treatment. And then this one will obviously be insecticide. So if they do have it broke down into groups, so then you've got it memorized. You're like, oh, okay, I want to go to fungicide. So I know it's this one. And then you can open it up and then it's going to be all fungicides through a, uh, from start to finish. Okay. So let's just open it up to the introduction. Let's just kind of get a 101 introduction on here, okay? And right off the go, we see pesticide. So Mike, what the heck is the difference between pesticide, fungicide, herbicide, and insecticides? What is all this? What, what is all this sides business? Well, that's a really good question. So um, as you know, herbicide, herb, herb, as in weeds, controls your weeds, which is the which is the big bulk of it. And then you have fungicide, which is fungus, pretty straightforward. And then insecticide, pretty straightforward. That's control of insects. Pesticide basically is like a big circumference. It gets it all, okay? Pesticide is basically the name for all the sides. And then if you didn't know what you were going to spray. Oh, and side note, I should mention, I should mention. The majority of farmers already know what chemical they're going to use, okay? Depending on your, if you're from the north, depending on from the south, you know, you know every area has problematic weeds. We're from the south, Russian thistle and kochia are our nemesis, all right? We do have some buckwheat issues and we got Canada thistle issues. It's, you know, we still have other issues, but Russian thistle and kochia, they're, you know, it's, they're very drought tolerant weeds and we're fairly drought prone. So if I'm going to grow wheat, I already know what I'm going to spray on that. If I'm going to grow derm, I already know what I'm going to spray on that. If I'm going to grow red lentils, I already know what I'm going to put in front of the red lentils because we know that you can't really control much with red lentils. And I know what I'm going to spray again on top of the red lentils. If I'm going to grow canola, I already have, I already know. So Mike Mitchell's I already got his chemical booked. So he really doesn't need this, but this manual is still handy. And we're going to, and I'm going to break down the reasons why. Well, Mike, how do you know? How do you, how do you already know? How do you have your chemical booked? How do you know what you're going to use already? It's actually really simple. It's because you already know what works, right? You know what gas station you're going to get to. You know what's, which is the most convenient. We, we already know what works, all right? So you only got about this much worth of herbicides, right? Which isn't that many if you really think about it. And uh, when you break that down to what crop that you're growing in the area that you're going to be, because maybe you're in an area where, you know, soil zone matters. So you know, some chemicals you're okay to put on like black soil zone, some you're not really should be putting on like brown soil zone and gray soil zones and so on and so forth. So, you know, that can eliminate a few of your options right off the go. And perhaps maybe you got to focus a little bit more on like individual weeds that are most problematic to you. Okay. So let's talk about kosher and Russian thistle because we already have been. So perhaps that's your problem, right? So maybe you're going to load up your tank with a little bit more 2,4-D and a little bit more phylox. I'm talking active ingredients here. Um, but whatever you're going to be dynamite on, you're always going to be weak on something else. You can't have your cake and eat it too because it's too hot. It's more than what the crop can take. So you're going to be dynamite on like the koshas and the Russian thistles, which are a serious problem. Um, they will suck a lot of moisture out. They will uh, take a lot of yield and they'll drop like 100,000 seeds per plant if left unattended, and which will set you back to the stone age. So you don't really want that either. But that mix could be weak on, say, hawksbeard. 
So you're like, well, I want, I need to get the Hawks beer too, Mike. That's a serious problem. That's a bad weed. Yeah, you're right. It is a bad weed. So maybe you're going to have to throw in some Express, but you got to be careful because Express is pretty warm too. You already went out with a pretty hot mix. That's pretty hot right now, just so you know. So now you're going to throw in a little bit of Express. Now you're getting into the little bit of the danger zone here. So you got to be careful about how much you're going to put down with your crop. Now, in saying that, when you're spraying out a broad leaf out of a cereal crop, there is a pretty significant amount of room for error, okay? Stay with me on this. But if you're taking out a grassy weed out of a cereal crop, there is less margin for error, okay? Let's talk about that for a second. Basically, it's because you're trying to take out your cousin without killing yourself, okay? Because you're in the same family. That's where it gets dangerous. When you're trying to take out a broadleaf weed uh, out of a grassy, well, it's... You're not, you're, not, you're not even in the same family, so it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to take out, uh, say, a broadleaf weed out of a broadleaf crop, such as a lentil or a chickpea or a field pea or something, again, now you're, now you're trying to pull out of the same family, and it's going to be a lot harder on the crop. So when I go out and I'm going to spray a grassy chemical on a grassy crop, and I'm going to try to take out, uh, like, wild oats, millet, um, maybe some downy or Japanese brome, whatever it might be, those are all kind of the same family as your wheat and your derm, okay? So when you spray that type of chemical on to take out those weeds, and you have to, you need to take those weeds out. They'll do significant damage. They'll, they'll choke your crop right out, so you got to do it. You will slap that crop, all right? It'd be, like, it'd be like you getting slapped in the face. It will be like, bam, slap that crop, and then all of a sudden it's going to turn yellow. It's called a flash, and then um, it could stay yellow and it's going to come pick back up. In fact, some, in some cases, depending on how hard you hit it, it can also stunt it. It will actually stunt it. Now, most of the chemical companies be like, oh, no, you're not use, losing any yield. I haven't seen that yet myself. But you will, can definitely stunt it and you'll definitely flash it and it will take a couple weeks to come back out of it, okay? Now, another couple contributing factors to uh, crop flash and uh, so on and so forth, and it needs to be noted, is crop staging which means what is the application of what is the crop heights, crop staging of when you spray it, okay? Because you can spray it too small and kill it, and you can wait till it gets too big and significantly hurt it, okay? Also, what are you, what are you tank mixing it with? Because you can typically tank mix. Uh, so depending on maybe you put way too much Phlox Beer 24D in with your tank mix, and that would also go against and uh, flash your crop even harder as well. So over here... Let's take a look at this for a second. For a second, other contributing factors would also be environmental. Like, uh, is your crop stressed? Is it heat stressed? Are you out there spraying when it's too hot? Um, is it too cold? Um, was it? Uh, did you get hailed or something? Is there something that physically beat the crop up? Is trying to come back? Did you have any carryover um, issues, damage on your crop from the year prior? Is it trying to push through something like that? You know, are you already like basically if you have a cold or a flu? And then you get another cold or a flu, right? You know, is there anything that can compound the issues? So right here, each chemical typically has a breakdown or each. Uh, so I guess we need to define chemical and trade names and formulations and so on and so forth. So let's just do that first. So trade names is something that they give the name. So for example, each company, there's three of them here, have this same formulation or very similar and each one calls it. So AgriCity calls it their uh, M Power Foxy Buck M. Whoo! Adama Canada calls it their Force Fighter M. Okay, these are their given names. New Farm Agriculture, and these are the chemical companies, okay? New Farm calls it their Enforcer M. Now, they sometimes keep the same M, and M's probably for MCPA. Uh, but back in the day when there was only like one company for it, then they would actually have the, the given name, trade name up here. Okay. But now since there's so many, and you're going to see this lots where there's up to like six or seven different companies with the same formulation, it's because it's all generics, right? Um, the, I guess whatever ran out on them and uh, now everyone can make them. So, so now the chemical books are actually just putting the formulation up here and then just putting all the different companies in their names down here. So we see that both in this book. So you're going to see this and then I'm sure if we were to page over fortress right here fortress that is a given name all right and then the chemical company is down here and then there's the formulation right there okay 
So you got both. So you're paging through and you're like, oh, that's a given name. I'm like, oh, there's the formulation name. And it kind of gets a little bit confusing, but I wish that it would just kind of stick to one or the other. Now let's just come over here and take a look at these uh, um, groups for a second. So you got your fluoxepyr and MCP, MCPA, uh, that is a group four. And your bromoxynol is group six. Now they never change, but four doesn't necessarily mean it's only fluoxepyr. That just happens to be these two are a group four. You can have a bunch of different uh, formulations under group four. There's actually quite a few. I do believe it bromoxynol is maybe limited to a couple other friends in that group six. It's Group six is a fairly limited group, but there's definitely lots of group fours. In fact, let's just turn to the back of the book here before we continue. I don't know if you can see this with this light on, kind of shining back. Hold on here and see if I can't get a better look at this. Okay, now uh, let's just go over here for a second, see if we can get, get some natural light. Here we go, that's a little bit better. So you see this triangle right here? So this triangle represents the groups, the herbicide groups, and it represents the risk of resistance, okay? So your group one and your group two is the highest. So that means that you gotta be extra careful with the higher groups, with the, with the with the groups one and two, because you can easily build a chemical resistance against them if you misuse them, okay? Then the next one down is group five, it's moderate to high. Can you guys see this okay? Hold on here. See if I can zoom in a little bit. Then you got your um, three and eight is moderate. Then you got 722 and other is low to moderate. And then you see you got your four and your group six down there in your low. And then group nine, you all know what group nine is. Group nine is your glyphosate. It's also low. Okay. So you want to you want to be really careful with your ones and twos, which I should note are your grassy chemicals if you didn't know that. Okay. See, see what this says down here. Oh, perfect right here. Group one is your grassy control. So you got all these, the coflops. Most of them are the FOPs. <laughs> um, these are the formulations, these are the actives. And now, so let's just say for a second, you do have group one resistant wild oak. If you do, most likely it's this one right here. Uh, this uh, Claude and FOP business, this little guy right here. I do believe he's like the old trade name Horizon and he's been around for years and 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 years, all right? So guaranteed, if you have group one resistant wild oats, it's probably the FOPs. Um, I think some of the newer ones are the dims. So you're going to want to switch to the dims, okay? You want to get to the newer chemicals because, yes, you might have group one resistance, but these are different formulations and they will attack differently. So just because you've got group one resistance wild oats does not mean, hopefully it doesn't mean, that the dims, the dens are completely uh, useless to it as well, okay? Now, if that do be the case, there is a few options in group two, for your grass control, such as like your Simplicity, which is a trade name, um, so on and so forth, and you can put that on wheat as well, okay? So it is important, basically what I'm saying here, it is important to know your groups, and we already know that the one and two, which are your only grassy control in your cereals, are the most prone to resistance. So you gotta use them carefully, rotate them. Don't be just using the flop, 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 because, well, that's all everyone's done for 20 years because that was the only, only option there is. Now we're getting more options. So, you know, let's throw out some dims and let's get into the twos where we can use the two because if you're going to come back in with a, um, a grassy in your wild oats for, say, your lentils or something, I uh, guarantee you it's going to be a one, right? It's definitely going to be a one. So I would be trying to use two when you're in cereals and so on and so forth. So you just got to know your groups. You need to know your chemicals and you need to rotate those things. So that way you can use them wisely and hopefully you can use them for a long term. Oh yeah. And I probably should mention too, I think this den, I think you can put on is barley, but not derm. So there is obviously depending on what you're growing here, but you guys, you guys got to get the idea. And I also just realized that this video is getting way too long. So uh, we're gonna have to break this up and break it into a part two. So I appreciate, I appreciate you guys following me through this video. Uh, make sure you come back and check it out next time in the next video, because we haven't even got to the carryover restrictions and uh, the recropping intervals and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll see you guys on the flip side. Adios amigos.